Hello YouTube, it is Sons of Three Kingdom. We are back because CA is back with some more updates. Um, I like to just kind of run through them all. Today I'll be running through, uh, earlier this month they had a FAQ um, for Total War Three Kingdoms. And then after that we'll be running through the Sun Tian uh, tr intro trailer. Uh, they did release, obviously, another 12 minute long game demo trailer. I'm super excited about that, uh, but I am just going to leave that for another day uh, because there's obviously a lot more to go through with that one. So, let's go through the FAQ here on the Total War blog. Uh, I just thought there was a few things interesting here, nothing too mind-blowing. Uh, the ones I want to highlight, will hero use be historically authentic, um, etc. So, the thing here is, as I've explained to, uh, explained it before, the romanticization, which is being, uh, represented here in the kind of, like, romanticized mode, and then the historical variation of this period, which is being represented on the classic mode, uh, they do both lean he heavily on characters, like, the eventual romantic traditions has, you know, these characters who are able to just turn the entire tides of battle and politics and the fatal kingdoms just on the back of their hands and their ingenuity and their, you know, martial prowess. But if you read the actual historical source, it is very character driven. Um, that might be a quirk of how history was written in, uh, kind of 2nd century, 3rd century AD China, which is when most of the primary uh, sources were compiled. But nonetheless, um, the reason that characters are so important to any representation of this period of history is because that is the representation we have, for better or worse. Uh, this was really, you know, if you are a student of history at all, you know that uh, back in the day, people, you know, did what we call the great man theory of history, and Three Kingdom was basically the h highest example of Great Man Theory of History. So, I, it's good to see that even in classic mode, characters will take a huge, huge uh, role in it. And uh, it won't just be like a, a traditional Total War where you have a single character per army and that's a general. Um, I like the fact that they appear with their retinues of bodyguards. Uh, because that is historically how it seems to have really worked in uh, the this period of history. As I explained before, historically these battles would largely happen around clashes of mass lines of levies, and then you would have these individual captains, um, you know, perform extreme feats of bravado with their companions. So yeah, that this this, this part looks like it will be quite accurate. Um, I also like the fact that they're not killing off the entire idea of duels. Uh, now, obviously, duels is really romanticized. If you think about two armies of, you know, tens of thousands of clashing, it seems very unlikely that two individual heroes are going to find each other and, uh, and decide the fate of the battle. But then again, when we go back to the historical sources, this happened, not one-on-one, -on -one, but basically these elite retinues would seek each other out. They would station themselves at the most key points of the line and they would just, uh, they would just have it out. Um, you know, they really were, uh, basically you gotta just replace, uh, if you think about a European battle and how important knights were, um, and formations of knights were, you gotta just replace the formations of knights instead of with a warrior class, just with these retinues of, crazy ass warriors being led by larger than life personalities so i think all of this makes sense roughly to me um yes the classical mode will be much more historical but then the history of this period was very crazy and it was based on larger than life characters uh so yeah that's that's my thoughts on this update i'm happy to you know since the games when the game was first announced i was very very skeptical about the entire idea of doing a total war three kingdoms uh but every update so far they seems to have it seems to have taken a direction that i would like so it's been very respectful they've you know paid a lot of attention to both the history and the cultural romanticization so now today what we're going to do is go over this uh sun Tian trailer now 
previously I've gone over Liu Bei and Cao Cao. They were arguably the founders of two of the three kingdoms. Uh, well, Sun Jian was the third guy. And it's very unfair to call him the third guy because it makes it seem like his kingdom was the kingdom that he, his family would eventually found um, was like the weakest of the three. That's actually not true at all. Uh, if anything, Liu Bei's kingdom was undoubtedly the weakest of the three. Uh, Sun Jian's was considerably more developed and stronger and kind of more important uh, than Liu Bei's dynasty. But the problem is that it, the traditional narrative is really about Cao Cao and his side struggling against Liu Bei and his side. So unfortunately, these guys, the Sun family and the eventual state of Wu that they will find, uh, found, uh, kind of take a backseat. So as usual, I'm going to be um, playing through this trailer and uh, kind of like pausing it and adding my own uh, lines whenever. All right, here we go. From this disorder, we have found opportunity. The will of heaven. The imperial seal. Okay, so right off the bat, a few things. So who is Sun Jian? Sun Jian was a... Uh, I, I guess he came from a merchant's family, quite a large merchant's family. And um, he, his family kind of bought themselves into minor government positions. And then during the coalition against Dong Zhuo, uh, against the tyrant, uh, that also Cao Cao, as I've previously said, was a part of, uh, Sun Jian really came to the fore here. I talked about Cao Cao's uh, participation in the coalition, how it was kind of a mixed bag. It was kind of tragic. He lost a pretty big battle. Uh, that was not the case for Sun Jian at all. Sun Jian just steamrolled that entire goddamn campaign just any like basically every recorded battle we have of this entire coalition against Dong Zhuo was just Sun Jian steamrolling his enemies that was really it and he wasn't one of the 18 you know prominent governors or anything he was working under a guy called Yuan Shu now Yuan Shu is the younger cousin of Yuan Shao who is uh that man that we saw you know kind of like friends turn enemy against Cao Cao earlier. Uh, Yuan Shu is, you know, as illustrious as Yuan Shao. Uh, he was definitely, you know, probably the second most important person in this coalition. They're from the same incredible, incredibly, you know, magnificent family, magnificent noble family. And uh, Yuan Shao kind of headed up the northern front of the campaign against Dong Zhuo. Like he headed up the northern front of the alliance. And Sun Jian base uh, and Yuan Shu, sorry, basically headed up the southern front of the alliance. And Yuan Shu's most capable general, uh, the vanguard of his front, if you will, is this man named Sun Jian. Uh, it's interesting here that they seem to have given Sun Jian tiger skins, and they gave him a you know a cloak with a ferocious tiger on it. Uh, Sun Jian had the nickname of the Tiger of Jiangdong. Um, you know, we don't know when this nickname was given. Uh, but yeah, it does go to the cultural view of how ferocious this guy was. He claims to have been descended from the legendary Sun Tzu himself, as in the author of The Art of War. Um, basically, every historian goes, no, that's bullshit. That's, there's no way that's true. That This is what people did back then. They just all claim they were descended from whoever. But nonetheless, this guy is very skilled at war. Um, in terms of Tiger of Jiangdong, what does that mean? Well, Jiangdong means east of the Yangtze River. Um, that's quite literally what it means. And the Yangtze River is the largest river in China. It's actually the second largest river in the world. It's just a mag ludicrously large river. And um, Jiangdong is the lands east of the Yangtze River, which is kind of the southeast of China. If you think about the southeastern coast, if you think about where modern Shanghai is or modern modern Nanjing, etc., he's kind of from that area. Um, Except he's not really. It's just he had a lot of support in that area and they eventually set up their base camp from that area. 
uh, but I'm almost certain that he's from the mid Yangtze Delta, which is kind of different. But you know, it doesn't sound as cool as the Tiger of Xiangdong, I guess. So what is this scene showing? Well, it's showing that when he was the vanguard of uh, you know the southern front of the alliance, they were meeting tremendous success. He was beating Dong Zhuo's forces at every turn. He beat Lu Bu like several times in history. Um, you know, army to army, not not duel or anything, obviously. Uh, and he, uh, well, the, well, this is the part that it starts getting to romanticization. This part is not historically true, but in the romanticization, oh, maybe it is historically true. So, sorry, I have to look this up. Um, but in the romanticization, he enters Luoyang, the capital city that Bong, Dong Zhuo burns to the ground on his retreat west. And he finds it in a great fire. He's trying to, you know, take control of the city, not that there's any resistance. And uh, whilst he's searching through his city, his men find the imperial seal. That is the seal of the imperial family that kind of signifies their rule over the entire empire, uh, just like hidden in a well. And he finds this and he decides... He, him and his followers basically decide that this is a great portent. Um, it means that they're meant to do great things. So instead of being this kind of tool for this dysfunctional alliance, um, instead of being this like, you know, third tier player that's winning the majority of the alliance's victories, this is when Sun Jian just begins to think maybe he's meant for greater ambitions. Did destiny choose me? Tyrant fled west to Chang'an with his grip on the world failing. I knew what I had to do. And what of our so-called coalition? Nothing but selfish conspiracy. Firing warlords. We can trust only ourselves. So that is, you know, for the because we've seen Yuan Shao before. Um, you know, the man standing back there. That was uh, only we can trust. That was Yuan Shao again. Um, the man who led the coalition and who was Cao Cao's friend, and then later turned Cao Cao's bitter enemy. This scene would pretty much be a kind of like a basic dramatization of Sun Jian. He found the Imperial Seal in secret. He won all these great uh, victories for the Alliance. The Alliance doesn't really seem to be going that well. So now he's thinking, maybe I can do something else. I Heaven is on my side. Um, and this is symbolizing him leaving the Alliance. Now, there's, there's a lot of romanticized lore about this. Um, it's... Uh, Basically, the romanticized law is that Yuan Shao finds out that he has the imperial seal, and uh, basically, together with you know a few of Yuan Shao's vassals, they set a huge ambush for him, and they kill him. Uh, they kill Sun Jian. Um, I mean, that's a crazy. That's the weirdest part about explaining one of the. I mean, Sun Jian and really like the entire that entire state is that. Uh, whereas the state of Wei was c basically completely built by Cao Cao, and the state of Shu is completely built by Liu Bei, the state of Wu is not built by Sun Jian alone, but it's built by the entire family, because his family had the tragic trait that all they all kept dying, and Sun Jian died very very early into the Three Kingdoms. Um, basically, after he tried to go off on his own. Uh, Yuan Shao ordered his vassals to basically ambush Sun Jian and just killed him off. So what we had is this incredibly talented, seemingly ambitious commander uh, kind of just die very, very early on. Um, and then his very young son is has to take up the mantle. And, and this is a pattern that keeps repeating itself across the state of Wu's history. Um, so they don't really get like a cool, stable ensemble. They really rely on the family, which is why I think he keeps referring to his families, because it, the family as a whole is very, very famous, and each one of them gets a... They're like candles that burn twice as bright for half as long. They come onto the stage, make, you know, like an immense impact, 
and then they tragically for one reason or another kind of like have to go off and this is not this does not just go for the family it also goes for a lot of their followers it's an interesting fashion to be sure um i i you know if i wasn't if i didn't have such a massive Cao Cao, you know, fanboy syndrome going on. I would say on balance, the state of Wu is probably my favorite kind of like faction in this era, if you could call it that. Us only ourselves. You, my children, will see our Sun Dynasty rise. You are my purpose, my destiny, the legacy. Of Sun Jian, Tiger of Jian Dong. Okay. Legacy. Uh, that was so inspiring that I didn't want to break it up too much, but time to explain a few more things. So as I, you know, just alluded to, the Sun family, it is a family. It's definitely a family enterprise. Um, d just because they all tra kept meeting very tragic fates, but luckily many members of this family seem to be very, very exceptional. Um, they crawled back from the brink so many times that it's it's hard to argue that it was just like you know they were just all trading on their dad's good name um so it's kind of hard to guess from here who might be who uh, the man in the the man in the center is obviously silly sun Jian, the tiger of jiang dong the patriarch of the family uh i am going to believe although i'm not sure it's true he looks kind of too old but this man might be sun Ce. it's either this man or this man um Sun Ce is Sun Jian's oldest son, and he's called the Little Conqueror. Um, he basically, at the Sun Jian, you know, young, talented general, the patriarch of the family, uh, tragically killed in an ambush. That part happened in both history and the romanticization. You can't really, you know, romanticize your way out of your great hero just dying in history. That's just whatever. So, and then Sun Ce kind of take up his father's mantle, and... Uh, Conquers a large swath of territory. Um, he, you know, wins many great victories as a vassal of uh, Yuan Shu, who is the Yuan Shao's younger cousin and the kind of like a very prominent warlord in southern China, as I mentioned. And then after that, yeah, he conquers a great swath of territory at the age of 19 with some of his father's own loyal retainers and some of his own childhood followers, etc. Um, I think the man on the right is Sun Qian. Uh, Sun Quan is... Uh, the um younger son of sun Jian, uh you know also just like very accomplished in his own right uh i think this woman here um so obviously i've seen the other trailer they call her sun ren now sun ren is not a character who exists in history but i'm not going to diss it for that reason because one other thing about the sun family is that they had a number of exceptional women uh actually for that matter so did the so did the Cao Cao the Cao family but you know going to the Sun family this is about the Sun family I can't keep talking about Cao Cao um the Sun family had a number of uh extraordinary women among their ranks uh who kind of in they contributed greatly to the founding of their state and their dynasty and I think Sun Ren is probably a composite character of just like a few of these characters that existed um yeah, some of the Sun family women, a lot of them were just known for being very, uh, you know, just just very competent rulers because this is what happens often when you see, a, you know, a huge system, a huge empire break down into a, a warlord state You um, and the men just keep on dying because obviously during a period of civil war, uh, men die very quickly. And in these kind of old clannish societies, uh, you will see the women kind of just like take uh, you take the mantle and just keep on going. Um, you know, this happened many times in history. Uh, if you think about, um, uh, you know, Zenobia, for example, the, the, uh, the queen of the, uh, the empress, really, of the Palmyrian Empire during the uh, Roman crisis of the third century. Uh, if you even think about uh, popular depictions, like, 
Game of Thrones. What is happening in Game of Thrones right now as of, you know, the current seasons? It is literally every single family's lost all their dudes. It is time for the women to stand up. You cannot, family has to come first. You have to uphold the family. So Sun Ren, I think, is a composite character probably of two separate characters. The first one is Lady Wu. Now, Lady Wu is Sun Jian's wife. Um, and after Sun Jian dies, she just moves heaven and earth trying to keep the family together during the tough years. And she was seen as just like a very respectable uh, respectable statesman or stateswoman, as I should say in this case, um, who advises uh, Sun Tzu and Sun Jian on several important things. And then the other character, she's probably a... Uh, Com uh, draws inspiration from um, if anybody's played Dynasty Warriors, they're aware of a character named Sun Shangxiang. Now, unfortunately, Sun Shangxiang is not her historical name. Um, we don't know her historical name. We just know that she's called Lady Sun, and she is Sun Quan's youngest sister. And she is known for, uh, in the romantic traditions, she gets a uh, she gets a very very rough shitty treatment they basically make her this like lovesick puppy it's a tomboy it's bullcrap but in the historical tradition she's known for being a martial princess who you know loved marching around with her like just like armed i guess armed girlfriends just like she just had a band of armed girls they walked around enforcing the will of the swim family um and eventually she in a diplomatic alliance married liu bei and the romantic traditions, because Liu Bei was a good guy, they made her into this, you know, la di da, oh, I love my virtuous husband, etc. No, nah, fuck that. In actual history, she was badass. They say that she, you know, is a diplomatic marriage, but what she actually is, because as I alluded to, the state of Wu is more powerful than the state of Shu. Uh, both of them put together are far weaker than Wei. Um, you know, both of them put together are far weaker than Cao Cao. But the state of Wu is more powerful than the state of Shu by far. Sun Quan, um, the Sun family are more powerful than Liu Bei. And this diplomatic marriage, if you read between the line of history, it is basically she was at Liu Bei's court as his wife, but also basically as a symbol of Sun family power. She did not let that shit go. She kept her armed retinue about her all the time. Um, Liu Bei was described to be often just physically scared of like you know, like her, um, and would give her a very wide berth, and yeah, and her presence there, it almost seemed like she wanted her presence there to make Liu Bei and, you know, his followers remember, hey, this is the state of Wu, I, I am the state of Wu, you would, like, you know, this is our presence, and you will remember who your allies are and who your backers are, um, so I have absolutely no problems with them putting uh, Sun Ren here as a comp as a composite character of uh, many of the you know powerful women of the Sun family. Um, the other thing I kind of want to go through is that, um, yeah, as we see here, this is basically the uh, I mean this is kind of a map of China. Like it's it's kind of hard to tell because it's only a small part of it, but. You know, if, for people who, uh, if, if you want to get a clear idea, like over here will be basically Taiwan, like just slightly off here. Uh, modern day Hong Kong will be here. Uh, and down here, you know, once it stretches past, it will be Vietnam. Actually, the Sun family ended up ruling over a large part of northern Vietnam for a long time. Um, and so what do, I mean, what do I mean by Jiangdong, east of the river? Well, this is the river. This is the Yangtze River. It is a, a very large river. And uh, Jiangdong east of it basically means here. So if you want to look at this map of China, this is basically how the Three Kingdoms eventually breaks down. The Sun family and the state of Wu hold the, you know, southeastern China stretches. This is like modern day Shanghai here, basically. Um, stretches from there all the way down south into Vietnam. Um, Liu Bei and the state of Shu eventually settle themselves in this area, what's called the Sichuan Basin. Um, it's in the southwest. Uh, this, you know, stretches down eventually here, if you want to think about it, into, like, Burma and such. Um, and then, uh, not really shown in this map, but Cao Cao and the state of Wei ends up holding the entirety of the north. Um, including, you know, to the west all the way to kind of, like, the modern-day Tarun Basin. Um, to the east, they end up holding, like, a large swath of modern-day North Korea. Um, 
yeah, geographically, that's how it breaks down. And listen, I'm sorry. I know I did promise a lot of content um, about, you know, the breakdown of geography and administration and warfare at this age. Uh, but, you know, I, what can I say? I got lazy and there wasn't a lot of new stuff from Total War. But, um, well, here's one thing and here it is. So I hope uh, that was roughly, you know, informative as usual. Um, sorry if I rambled a bit. And uh, I will see you guys very soon when I give the breakdown on that 12-minute demo. All right. Thanks, all. Peace out.